So we're going to have a look at human dimorphism. So human dimorphism, uh, it affects obviously biology, but by extension, uh, it also affects behavior and the patterns that we see within society. So as a result, uh, human dimorphism has an impact on both the basic biological processes as well as uh, our everyday actions and behaviors. So what is dimorphism? What are we talking about when we are talking about dimorphism? Well, uh, the word dimorphism is a noun and in zoology specifically and in biology uh, we are talking about the occurrence of two forms of distinct uh, creatures, distinct in structure, coloration, etc., among animals of the same species. Now, when we're talking about sexual dimorphism, this refers to such differences in distinct form between the two sexes of a naturally occurring sex binary in mammals. So, we're going to have a look at the differences in the male and the female skull and how these uh, change the facial features and how these are interpreted uh, by the opposite sex. So if we have a look here, these are not real faces, they are computer generated faces. So these are an average face, uh, but these on the left side are more female and as you see here a b e and f there is a clear uh, clear view that you can see here that these are all female faces so on the very far left a and e we can see very feminine facial forms and b is a slightly more masculine form but is still clearly female then C and G, D and H, we can see that these are masculine forms. So you'll notice some differences, which we're going to go into uh, some more detail. Uh, notably, the brow ridges and the bone structure around the eyes and also uh, the bone structure in the jaw. And this affects how uh, a person is interpreted uh, to be male or female. So firstly, have a look at these two skulls here. Now I want you to have a look at these skulls and you can guess whether they are male or female. I'll give you a moment. Is the left male or female? Is the right male or female? Now, to the untrained eye, you may simply see two skulls. And that's okay. But uh, there's some very large structural differences here when uh, we know what to look for. Back here, we can see the difference in shape, the square socket that we have, and the very round sockets that we have here. Then the supraorbital foramen has dull edges to the upper borders in males. Why do they have dull upper edges? Well, you have to think uh, of the role of a male in biology. What is the biological role of a male. Well, males are designed to be more combat orientated than females. They are designed to protect the females and young. That means they have a heavier skeletal system, but also a skeletal system that is designed to take impact uh, stronger. So if we have a look here, the rounded edges means that if you get struck in the face, it is not going to tear 
through the muscle as readily as having sharp edges. So having a lot of sharp edges would not be good for a male if they get hit in the face. It's going to cut open their face. Whereas females, females have sharp edges to the uh, upper borders. And this supraorbital foramen is quite sharp. Why is that so? Well, females tend to not be physically combative. Uh, they can be, but in a generally different sense to males. Females tend to fight with words rather than physically. Although, of course, there are cases, but they are not designed for. If you compare this, you can see a clear ridge running all the way from one eye to the other eye. And here, that ridge is absent. Then the ramness and the body, a square angle and longer body, uh, are present in males. Now, this has been studied quite a lot. And it has been found that a longer jaw is seen as being more attractive to females, as is a wider jaw. But a wider jaw can be interpreted by females as uh, being aggressive. Uh, so then it starts to come down to a bit of personal preference. It's been found that uh, the most attractive jawline in males for females is a slightly long jaw but not too wide uh, and that is what females generally view to be the most attractive. Uh, some females that like a male that appears stronger they might like a slightly wider jawline. So if we have a look here uh, the ramus is very straight in males. The jawline is also very straight and angular. Whereas the ramus and body uh, is rounded and the angles are kind of egg shaped with a shorter body. So if we see here, this is not a stereotypically female design that we see in the haircut or anything like that, but we can still see this very evident shape this round egg shape, and that is very much associated with females. This rounded jawline, and the jaw tends to be shorter. The teeth themselves in females also tend to be shorter and uh, not as... If we go back here again, different. Sorry, let's go back there. So there it is, and take note here, it's going up all the way into the jaw, but in the female, it is short. Once again, short. A much lighter, much more petite skull. Here we have male straight. Here we have female rounded. And um, uh, why is that? What, why is the shape different? Well, females have a more developed frontal lobe. Than males and we're going to come into that a little bit more later but you can see the skull line is nice and rounded as you see here so it is quite convex and then we have the male and female brain so I have a question oh a very frightening question who are more intelligent men or women a dangerous question to ask but there is a scientific answer. What would you guess? On average, we're talking. So it is a bit of a stereotype, but we are saying on average, given the data that we have, what do you think? Who do you think are more intelligent, men or women? I will give you the answer. Um, now, why? why is that? What is the difference? Well, if you're looking at the top section, have a look in the connective lines uh, in this brain with the blue lines. 
have you noticed something? The connections here run mostly within the same hemisphere. And those connections do not go very far into the frontal lobe. How about the female brain? If we have a look at the bottom here, the female brain, those connections go all the way right into the front of the frontal lobe. And there is a very strong relation to the interhemispheric connections, so the connections between the two halves of the brain. So we have males at the top with a very linear thinking and females at the bottom with webbed thinking. All right. Now, these two different brain sets are to fulfill a biological niche. Male thinking is linear. It eliminates variables and the female thinking pattern is webbed. So it creates variables. Now, these seem to be the opposite and they seem to work against each other. That is not true. Uh, For example, let's imagine a mother and a father. Uh, the mother has this web thinking pattern, a multivariate thinking pattern, and she's saying, you know, my baby, I need to feed my baby, I need to clean my baby, I need to cook, I need to uh, pay the phone bill that's overdue, I need to do this, I need to that, assuming that the mother is the one that's looking after the baby. She has, now we're of course talking biologically, she has this brain setting that allows her to think of many variables at the same time uh, to take care of that child, because taking care of a child is a difficult job, there's lots of variables to go into it. And then, um, we have to think also that the female brain is better at remembering things. If you've ever had a uh, falling out or with your wife, or if you are a woman, uh, if you've ever had a falling out with your husband or such, uh, you would know that you certainly have a better memory than he does in many cases. Now, that is because the frontal lobe allows you to have a better memory especially females, I do apologize because some people are racing bicycles, not bikes, motorbikes outside. So back to the point. Uh, this lady has been doing the many things during the day and there's lots of variables to think about. Uh, but she notices something is wrong with the child. Now she's thinking about many things. The father comes home and she says to him, I think the baby's sick. It could be this, 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 and this. And she's giving all this information to the father. All right. Um, the father now has a, a univariate type of logic system where he's going to eliminate information. So the female brain, she's taking this one thing, the child is sick, she's creating multiple variants of possibility. The male comes along, he says, well, um, those all seem possible. Based on what you've said, it seems that this one and this one are the most plausible. So he's taking all that information and cutting it down. He might say to her, I think these two are the most plausible. And they have a discussion and they decide, actually, this is what is probably wrong with the child after they've discussed it. So really, this thinking style, it seems contradictory, but it is actually a supportive thinking style because they can run various concepts through the other one's mind and then arrive at a conclusion that they might not have been able to arrive at just by doing it themselves. Possibly they could. But this is certainly an advantage because it gives them two different thinking styles to reach that. Now, females have this web thinking pattern because they have an amazing corpus callosum, which I am showing you now. The corpus callosum is a section in the middle of the brain, which allows for interhemispheric connection and that is 25 percent 
larger in females, even though they have a smaller brain. Now, that means that they can connect those two different halves and share data between those two different halves of the brain at a much greater rate than males. Now, the size of the brain overall is different, and you would expect that because the average uh, surface area within the brain, the cubic centimeters, are different in the male and female skull on average. So the average male brain is 1,370 grams, and the average male or female brain is 1,200 grams. Now, females have, relative to cerebrum size, greater cortical gray matter volume and larger volumes of regions associated with language function. For example, Broca's area and Wernick's area and white matter involved in interhemispheric connectivity. There we have that again, interhemispheric connectivity. The number of neurons per unit volume in the planum tempora was also greater than in women than in men. So compared to women, men have been found to have larger volumes relative to cerebrum size or differences in neuronal densities in other limbic and paralimbic regions. What does all of that mean? So we've answered our question halfway here. Average male and female IQ is the same. Males on average will excel in some factors and females on others. We see here specifically white matter. Now, white matter is associated with IQ. And that means that the area of the brain with more white matter in a specific region will have more computational power. Therefore, that's why women are good at talking. Uh, and uh, many are very talented at learning languages. Now, that is because this area of the brain, the Broca's area, the Wernick's area, they have more white matter in females. But then we're looking here and we're saying, well, the male brain is 1,370 grams. The female brain is 1,200 grams. Doesn't that then mean that the larger the brain is, you know, men are going to be smarter than women. Not necessarily. Remember, we are talking about a uh, a concentration of specific neurons within specific regions. It simply means that the female brain is good at some things and the male brain is good at other things. They're not all good at the same things. You can compare it like this. You have two different types of computers. You have a desktop computer with a screen and the, the tower and the mouse and all of that. And you have a laptop computer. Now, the specifications of these two machines are exactly the same. All the components are the same. The graphics card is the same. It runs at the same heat. Uh, all these kinds of things. Uh, Actually, the brain, male brain is hotter. That's another difference in the skull uh, that I didn't mention here. But I'm getting off point. The point is that the design, the basic design is different, but the specifications are the same. This is why the average is the same for both. Of course, you get men and women that are much lower IQ than average, and you get men and women that are much higher IQ than average. But the average... IQ over the whole population is pretty much the same at about 100 IQ points. So you just have two different versions of the same thing. Obviously, uh, with a lighter frame, you don't want a massive brain in a light frame, which makes it difficult to and is unsightly. So if you have a look at the comparative sex IQ distribution, this is where things sometimes get a bit controversial. Women tend to, on average, be in this range of 95 to 105. 
that means if I walk randomly in the street and I choose 10 women I'm very likely to have chosen eight or nine women that fall in this range that's just my my highest chance however that's not true for men if I walk into the street and I randomly choose 10 men and I look at their IQs I'm probably going to find that only six of them fall into this mid-range because the spread of the IQ is a little bit different biologically women cannot afford to have a very low IQ that is because they need to uh, frankly be looking after children in their biological role and that takes a lot of computational power men on the other hand you have more variables and with that Y chromosome it depends what is being passed on it also depends on what X chromosome they've been given and there's more variables going into them so that means you have more men at the very low end of the IQ scale and more men at the very high IQ scale on average uh, so this then comes down to of course the main spread between men and women are fairly the same but at the very high end and the very low end, you're going to find more men than you are going to find women. There are a lot more skeletal differences, though. And this also changes how people are moving, how they are interacting and what they are good at. These are not small differences. Um, and these are not differences that are changeable. These are sex-based differences that are uh, essential to a health and well-being. So we've already talked about the skull. I won't go into that more. But we're going to have a look at the pelvis. The pelvis in women, the ilium is more flared. This is to give room, obviously, for expansion uh, when the female becomes pregnant. The woman is pregnant. Uh, the pelvis is tipped forward. This causes greater curvature in the lower spine. It allows her to have more stability when she's walking than a male would have. Especially when she's pregnant, she will need that. But it does put a lot of pressure on the lower spine, which means that women often have lower back pain. And she has a larger rounder pelvic inlet. We'll have a look more at that later. Her center of gravity, once again, compared to men, is much lower. And that is also because she's going to be cover carrying a child inside of her and she needs more balance for that. Shorter bones, a stockier design in that sense, um, and a change in the Q angle. And that is also, uh, it serves multiple purposes. That gives more stability in walking. Obviously, also, when she's pregnant, you need all the stability. So we're seeing right from the lower spine all the way down, it is designed for stability, not speed. All right, whereas the male here, we can see the center of gravity is higher. It might not seem like much, but this gives you so much more torque, so much more power, especially over a short distance that you're going to have a clear advantage um, in speed. The pelvic inlet here we see is much smaller and the ilium is not nearly as flared. This wide hip spacing in females that we see on the right this also gives that female sway in the hips. So if we were having a look here closely, we see the subpubic angle in females is 90 degrees or more. And in males, it is less than 90 degrees. The sacrum is tilted back in females and it is tilted forward in males. If it was tilted forward in females, this would be a serious problem giving birth 
because the canal needs to be open. You can just see the shape here is completely different. The pelvic inlet is really wide and the ilia are spread wider. More muscle attachment for giving birth. And here we see in the male that the ilia is much closer together. So the Q angle, we are looking at the anterior superior iliac spine and going down all the way to the midpoint of the patella. And the angle there we see in relation to the hip is 18 degrees in females and 13 degrees in males. Doesn't seem like much. Five degrees, eh, it's not a big issue. Actually, it is. It's a massive issue. It changes the whole way that you walk. So, like I said before, the females, they have that feminine sway, we call it, when they're walking. The hips rocking from side to side. That is caused by this Q angle. And this changes the amount of pressure that is on the anterior of the knee. Remember, males are able to give a lot more power and a lot more torque. They have longer bones and their legs are much straighter forward. But let's imagine, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting excited here. Uh, let's imagine we have a male and a female built with exactly the same proportions and pretty much the same weight we'll go with and relative same muscle mass. So they're almost exactly the same. Even with the same muscle mass, the male is going to have a clear advantage over the female because of this Q angle. Also, he's going to have an advantage because the fibers in male muscle are thicker. So even if he has the same amount of muscle, those muscles have thicker fibers which means he will have more power output. So here we have an image of that typical stance that we can see in a female. The hips rocked and the angle is quite wide. The anterior cruciate ligament or ACL is one of the key ligaments that help to stabilize the joints in your knee and it connects your thigh bone or your femur to your shin bone which is the tibia and that's often uh, torn in sports but women are at a significantly higher uh, uh, higher risk of this kind of damage so they have a smaller temporal notch which is this ACL and the wider pelvis increase of the Q angle means that they have far much more pressure. They have different hormones and then the quad and hamstring ratio and the nerve muscle coordination. Remember, the male brain has more uh, development in the kind of athletic side. So there's more nerve and muscle coordination control in there. And then the basic shape of the foot and the angle that the foot is reaching, the angle inversion, this is all different because of the Q angle. This is a massive difference. All right. The basic design for males is far more combative. The female design is not designed to take so much pressure on the knee. It means sudden twists and turns such as basketball, soccer, tennis, volleyball, even things like running and then some very high strain sports, for example, uh, long distance athletics or uh, let's say things like jumping, high jumping, long jump, those put a significant amount of stress on the knee and we see that females are generally injured at far higher rates than men. So this is the normal knee that you see on the left, the patella and the posterior cruciate ligament, and then the anterior cruciate ligament, 
and then what happens is uh, when it gets injured you can see the torn anterior cruciate ligament gets torn like this because of that Q angle that has put pressure and the knee has swiveled out and twisted. <coughs> so, uh, as you can see here, this person has been hit in the leg, maybe they're playing football, and because of knee abduction, The femur and the tibia are twisting in opposite directions and that is causing the knee to twist apart like this. This is a very, very painful and unpleasant injury to have. So muscle differences. Male muscles are higher capacity for anaerobic metabolism and they generate a higher maximum power output than female muscles. Strength and muscle characteristics were examined in the bicep brachii and vastus lateralis of men and women, and those measured the motor unit number, the size and the activation, the voluntary strength of the elbow flexors and knee extent. What did they find? Well, the women were approximately 52 and 66 percent as strong as the men in the upper and lower body respectively so we can see significantly weaker than men and these are in professional athletes this is not like these women are just weak women these are strong women the men were also stronger relative to lean body mass lean body mass i should say a significant correlation was found between strength of muscle cross-section areas and the women had 45, 41, 30 and 25 percent smaller muscle CSAs for the biceps brachii, total elbow flexors, vastus lateralis and the total knee extenders respectively. Men had significantly larger type 1 fiber areas and mean fiber areas than women in the base of biceps brachii and significantly larger type 2 fiber areas and mean fiber areas in the vastus lateralis. What does that tell you? Well, it means even if they had the same muscle mass, the males would still have a clear advantage. Data suggests that the greater strength of men was due primarily to larger fibers. This would mean men would be stronger than women even at the same muscle. How about DNA differences? Well, humans, like other mammals, have a sex chromosome binary. A person is either male or female depending on their chromosomes. So a female would be two X chromosomes and a male would be X or Y chromosome. Sometimes the female chromosome is called the large chromosome. Does that mean abnormalities don't occur? No, we have lots of mutations, but these mutations are still either male or female. There is no third sex. They are always going to be male or female. So monosomy X, which means one X chromosome, often known as Turner's syndrome, um, is a condition where they have just one X chromosome karyotype. So Turner's syndrome is characterized by short stature. Dysmorphic features are common and that include low and posteriorly rotated ears, webbing of the neck, shielded like chest. Um, uh, cubus vulgaris, short fourth and fifth metacarpals, and hyperplastic nails. Often they have lymphedema, pigmented nevi, and many unfortunately have congenital heart defects. This is not a pleasant condition to have, but this person is a female. Uh, then we have Kleinfelter syndrome, and this is a genetic condition that results when a boy is born with an extra copy of an X chromosome. Um, it 
generally affects males and this specific mutation doesn't always clearly show up at an early age. Sometimes men are often um, diagnosed in adulthood when they are unable to have children. Then we have XYY syndrome, and this is the presence of an extra Y syndrome, uh, extra Y chromosome, sorry. And affected individuals are usually very tall. They have often very severe acne during adolescence, and they may have things such as learning disabilities or behavioral problems such as being very impulsive. And they're IQ is usually in the normal range, although on average, if they have siblings, it is generally 10 to 15 points lower. That's still a, a fairly normal IQ. Uh, then we have triple X syndrome, also called trisomy X, and it's a genetic disorder and they are female. And signs and symptoms can vary greatly and it depends how much of that X there is. Many experience no noticeable effects or only have mild symptoms. You may notice that people with this condition are taller than average height for most uh, typical physiological features. Uh, they usually experience normal sexual development and have the ability to become pregnant which is not the case in monosomy, where that can be a problem or basically impossible. Then we have XXXXY syndrome. And this is a chromosomal condition in boys. These are still boys and men that causes intellectual develop disabilities, developmental delays, physical differences and infertility. It, because of these two extra Y chromosomes, it usually disrupts their sexual development and they are not able to have a proper puberty. Boys and men with uh, this syndrome have mild or moderate intellectual disabilities and often have learning difficulties. Uh, speech and language development is particularly affected and because the linguistic areas of their brain can be infected or affected, sorry. Uh, it means that they may be able to understand, but they may not be able to fully express themselves. So they may be quite frustrated sometimes. Something to bear in mind when dealing with them. Just show a little bit of patience and try to communicate clearly. Pentasomy X is where a woman instead of having two X chromosomes, has five of them. And uh, it's associated with short stature, intellectual disability, characteristic facial features, heart defects, skeletal anomalies, uh, pubertal and reproductive abnormalities. Mm. We see that with the trisomy, Many women are able to have children and all this kind of thing without any problem, but with pentasomy, it is a problem and it might not be possible for some women.